So welcome along to another In Conservation With. I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Verda. There you go. Um, and I am here tonight with my guest, um, Ian Parsons, and we're going to be talking about well, his book, Seasonality, and basically talking about his experiences of the seasons. There you go, you got one as well. Uh, yeah. Seasons uh, across uh, it, across the year in the UK. Um, and before I even start, let me uh, quickly give a shout out to our sponsors. It's got to be done. Um, Leica Sport Optics is one of them, and the other one is CJ Wildlife, and they are a team of passionate nature lovers and experts in garden wildlife on a mission to make nature accessible uh, for everyone, whether you are a nature novice or a garden guru and they want to inspire and educate and provide the right tools to help wildlife thrive right on your very doorstep. So thank you very much, guys. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Ian Parsons. And Ian, how are you and where are you currently? I'm very well, David, thank you. Um, I'm currently in Mid-Devon um, in the southwest of England, where it's very, very wet. <laughs> Is it, um, it's interesting because um, I find, um, and this is a great opportunity to talk about the weather actually, because I know, you know, when you, when you start talking about the weather, it's like, oh God, you're talking about the weather, you've got nothing else to talk about. But actually, this is, uh, this is part of what we're talking about tonight, the weather, isn't it really? Yeah, absolutely. It's, that signifies our seasons and, you know, you don't need me to say, and everyone's noticed that the seasons have changed slightly, well, certainly from my point of view. Um, and I've often said that in England, you got like maybe a bit of a spring, then a summer for a couple of days across a period of a couple of months. And then it becomes autumn, which melds into November. And then it's November, 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 November until April or May. Yeah. Um, have you found the same? Yeah, I mean, this year has been a bit different. I mean, obviously, you know, Europe in experienced a very very dry hot summer um you know it was like that here in devon in extra madura uh where you are and where i was in september it was still very very hot and dry and it was a big relief to see that extra madura has had some rain uh in december a massive amount of rain by the look of it uh and we in november here in britain it was just so mild it was it was ridiculous we had plants in the garden that should have died off and they just hadn't died off and then we had two weeks in december where it was just freezing cold um had uh temperatures in the garden down as low as minus 10 which is um for us in mid devon that's very very cold and you know that's killed off quite a few things and and then suddenly christmas came along and since then it's just rained pretty much and almost in a in a wet season at the moment with no real um sign of it stopping uh, so we've got a lot of rain uh, but it's interesting what you say about the, the seasons. Um, just last year, I had chiff chaff in our garden um, during the winter, which was the first time I'd seen chiff chaff in our, in, you know, in our garden in November and December. And, you know, today I've noticed I've got a, a flowering plant. It's a non-native flowering plant. It's in a pot, but it's flowering mm -hmm. and it shouldn't flower until June. So I'm, it's, yeah, everything's all over the place, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, What's interesting, I mean, from my point of view in Extra Medjuda, um, I've noticed, as you said, a ton of rain. I mean, normally it rains between November and May and, you know, but not like it has recently in terms of, you know, loads of flooded fields and mud everywhere. My car's covered in mud permanently at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but you, as I said, and as you've said, you, and you've also been, this is your third, is it second or third time you've been on next, uh, in conservation with us? Probably your... second time. Yeah. yeah. Second. Yeah. Cause the first time you came when you talked about vultures, completely different subject in extra Medjuda. Um, this one. Yeah, that's it. Vulture, <laughs> that's it. Now, quick question before we start talking about seasonality. Um, if you had a proverbial gun to your head, mm. Extra Madura or Devon? Oh, see, that's very difficult because I'm I, I'm a proper Devonian, um, but I love Extra Madura. I mean, I first went there in the early '90s and just fell in love with it, and I've lived out there permanently uh, for stretches, um, and still spend a lot of time out there now. Still got a house there. 
I don't know. I really don't know, to be honest. I like the best of both worlds, I think. Um, it's it's difficult. I, I tend nowadays to avoid the summer in Extremadura because it is just so hot. Um, you know, we had a lot of people in, in Britain saying how hot it was for the few days we had it hot here. But I mean, it's it's eight weeks of, you know, close on to 40 degrees heat in Extremadura. And that's it's it's a hard, hard time to be there. Yeah, take it from me. It is. Mm. Um, what was interesting, I found quite funny, actually, I was watching the news, the BBC World News, or whatever, and, you know, the massive um, warnings in England. Tomorrow is going to be 40 degrees, you know, batten down the hatches, lock up your daughters, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> one day. Yeah, I know. I know. As you said, I had like a month of it. And yeah. it's a month is horrible because you know you can't go out basically you know no. and the hottest part of the day you'd think would be like midday or whatever it's actually at seven o'clock in the evening you know yeah. so you're kind of wiped out for the whole day it's not good but anyway seasonality where did the idea for this book come from um well kind of really from covid really which sounds a bit weird but i'd started making a few notes on on wildlife observations not really sure what I was going to do with them and then obviously March 2020 came along I was actually out in Extremadura um, suddenly everything was being locked down managed to get back to Britain on one of the last flights out not expecting to be in Britain for very long and as it turned out I was there for 18 months um, without being able to get back to Extremadura but what that did and what I didn't realize at the time it was going to do but it it enabled me to experience spring in Britain for the first time since 2011. Um, I'd spent every spring since then in Extremadura. So I hadn't seen swallows arriving in the village for nearly 10 years. And um, hearing the chiff chaff singing in, in mid-March, you know, in the garden, I just hadn't experienced that for 10 years. I, but I hadn't, I wasn't missing it because I hadn't realised I wasn't experiencing it. Um, it was just an amazing eye-opener really we were lucky that first lockdown if you you know if you can say you were lucky in that the weather was very very good over in Britain and we spent a lot of our time out in the gardens walking along the lanes around the village and just seeing so much stuff that I hadn't seen for so long seeing flowers come into flower early purple orchids all these plants I just realized I hadn't seen for so long and I just started making more and more notes about it and realizing how important it was as well to just see it that I can remember that first swallow of of um the spring in 2020 how it made me feel you know I, I just had counseled um people's holidays that were coming out to Exmajora to do guiding with me um and I counseled their holidays holidays they'd been looking forward to for so long and I, I was feeling quite low with it really it was it wasn't a nice thing to have to do I know it wasn't I had no control over it, but you still have to do it. You still have to ring them up and say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to counsel. And, you know, um, it wasn't great. And then just, I mean, it was beginning of April, just watching swallows fly overhead was just wonderful. I mean, in, you know, in Extremadura, I never saw them arrive apart from when I was living there, um, you know, uh, permanently. But since then, going back out in the spring, they're already there. I mean, they turned up in our village in Extremadura in January, end of January. So, um, to have them to see them arrive was I don't know something special and it just got my mind thinking about um, what's happening in the seasons why it's happening uh, how we experience how that wildlife experiences it and also how it makes me feel and how it can make people feel and being able to have time out in the garden was brilliant I mean we saw so many things that I don't know just you don't notice necessarily unless you, you you're you're having to focus on it because you can't go anywhere else i couldn't go anywhere else i was in the garden it was um yeah it was really good a really good experience and i just started writing things down and all of a sudden i had a, a a book formulating well that's good i mean it's interesting because you know there's been a few books out there over time about people's sort of recollections of a of a year in their village or whatever but I think what's interesting about your book is the fact that, you know, you've taken it a stage further as far as I can see, and you are actually talking and giving us some of the not so nice sides of the fact mm. that you've seen Skylarks and realised that they've actually declined in the Massively. UK, 75% like, or something. It's just, it's just, 
it's just alarming. Yeah, um, it is. And, and you know, I mean, I live in Mid Devon and, and most people think of Mid Devon as being a, a bucolic rural landscape, you know, full of wildlife and that. But it's it's not. Farming has had a big impact on so many areas of, of Britain and it's had a big impact on the wildlife and the way our habitats are managed, the way our rivers are managed. There's so much uh, problem nowadays with, uh, with sewage outfall going into our rivers and into the seas. It's having a big impact and things like the skylark. I mean, you, we walk around the village and we should have skylarks everywhere. We've got them in one place. Um, they should be all over the place. You go up onto the moor, Dartmoor, not very far away. And yes, they're there and you think it's great, but Dartmoors are refuge it's not they shouldn't be there they should be in the fields around the villages things like spotted flycatcher i mean you'll remember growing up spotted flycatcher were a pretty common bird but they're a struggle to find now in britain um you, you have to go to specific places to see them i can remember seeing them in my garden as a kid growing up and they were just part of the scenery and we've lost so much so i i didn't want to make the book um you know sort of rose tinted everything's perfect it's wonderful living you know in, in in the countryside and everything's wonderful our, our countryside and the species within it are, are under tremendous pressure and are in trouble and so it doesn't put, I, I don't pull punches in the book i try not to i want it to be optimistic i want you know i want it to come across as being an uplifting book but we we can't hide away from the truth which is that we are causing tremendous damage to our biodiversity yeah, because there's often, I mean, that's when I started looking at nature books, nature writing, in terms of reading these books years ago, it was all very rose tinted. It was all this flowery language talking about how wonderful the green rolling hills were and the sound of the cuckoo and all this sort of stuff. And I'm sitting there in London thinking, I just don't relate to this at all. No. Um, so the relatability is an interesting subject because, um, you know, Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world and i feel so embarrassed to say that um, yeah. and i see that even more now now that i've been moving around especially in europe you know i go to the baltic states i go to southeastern europe i come back and there's nothing here you know in, in britain and similarly living in spain mm. you, know, you walk down a country lane and the the bushes exploded sparrows or what have you yeah i mean that's something that i i barely remember as a kid in the uk in terms of this book um and we'll talk about some of the elements in the book in a minute but do you think that your if it if this book was a year in in you know, seasons would that have been very different maybe 20 or 30 years ago had you written it oh i think so yeah i think um just the abundance of wildlife around the village would be very different. I mean, go back to skylarks. Like I say, they would have been around the village as soon as you walked out of the house. We'd have had, we'd have been listening to skylarks. Um, and you know, the lark song in Extra Majora is incredible. Whenever I've had clients out in Extra Majora, I'm sure you've experienced many times yourself. People are amazed by the song, the bird song of the larks. You know, the calandra lark. I know it's different species, but they're basically filling the same niches. And you know, here, skylarks should be everywhere, and they're not. And I think 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they still would have been in better number. I mean, you only have to look at the, the way the turtle doves declined. Um, you know, I was, when I worked for the Forestry Commission as a ranger, we had one of the, the best sites in Devon um, for turtle dove was part of my beat. And they've just gone. They've just gone. We had, when, when I started there in, I transferred there in 1998, and I think we had 19 pairs across uh, a ridge um, called the Holden Ridge, just south of Exeter. And by the time I left, I think we had one or two, and I don't think there are any there now at all. And it's scary. It's scary how things are disappearing. Your area in Devon, how does that compare at the moment to elsewhere in the UK? I mean, reading this book, would I get jealous if I lived in, in Essex or in, you know? I, I don't think so. I've tried not to... Um, you know, right. I, I mentioned a few things that are, are very specific to Devon, for example, endemic trees. Britain, I, I could talk about trees forever. I mean, endemic trees in Britain, we've got a number of white beams and Devon has five species that are found nowhere else in the world, which what I personally. Well, there's the Devon white beams, the commonest one. Um, and I've got some of those growing in my garden. My favourite one of all, though, is no parking white bean, which is a tree that's found in just one valley in the entire world. And that happens to be in Devon. And yet no one 
talks about it, no one knows about it. If it was a butterfly found in just one valley in the world, it would be all over tourist information, leaflets would be everywhere. But trees, I don't know, it's weird. So there are a few things that are specific to Devon, but most of it is is common and garden wildlife. And that that sounds like it's not very exciting, but all wildlife is exciting, all wildlife is brilliant. And, you know, you will find 99% of the species that are mentioned in the book, you should find throughout certainly most of Britain, maybe up in the highlands of Scotland, you won't get so, some of them, but pretty much throughout Britain, you would find this wildlife. And having access to a garden, having access to parks, open space. I mean, I write about um, being in Exeter a few times, which, you know, for me, being a Devon boy is a big city. And I know compared to London, it's not, but it's still an urban area. It still has parklands. You can walk through it. I mean, I mentioned in the book, watching Great Tits Prospect in a stone wall in, in the city centre, watching peregrines in the city centre. Um, you know, we have wildlife all around us. It's it's sometimes we need to open our eyes to what we've got on our doorstep, I think. And how do we open our eyes for those watching um, now or in the future, wondering how do I see all this stuff? Because I remember when I was a kid reading people's books, I remember reading um, um, this guy called well, Ian Wallace, um, oh yeah 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 he he used to write stuff and he taught me about looking through flocks to find you know something unusual so looking through the usual to find an unusual thing um but i used to be insanely jealous reading this book or reading books like that how come they see all that stuff and when i go out i don't see anything you know so how what would you what advice do you would give someone i think it's always a never try and rush it and never Never turn down the opportunity just to just to stop still and, and listen and, and look at what's happening around you. And, you know, just by pausing, you can often see so much. I mean, we had fantastic views just before Christmas of a stoat that only because we happened to just stop um, on a road, a lane road going across a, a, a river. We stopped at the bridge and we just we just stood there just watching the water, not doing anything. We weren't doing anything. And then we saw the stoat. You know, we could have walked. We, if we'd have just carried on walking, we'd have never seen it. If we'd have been chatting away, we probably wouldn't have seen it. It's just that we just stopped and we just paused and we just didn't do anything. And it's amazing what you start to notice when you don't, um, when you're not busy preoccupying yourself with having a chat about what you're going to eat tonight, what you're going to do tomorrow. Oh, I need to get home because I need to do this. It's just taking time sometimes. And it, certainly with birds, especially, a lot of people always they're wanting to look for those rarities but enjoy what you've got we've got a, a blackbird and a robin that come to our back door here and we absolutely love them and i mentioned them both in the book and the blackbird in particular has become a real um almost like a member of the family and they're a very very common bird um but you can still get great enjoyment and we've learned so much about blackbirds just by watching how this bird behaves over the last three years and also picking up on things we had a red kite drift over i knew it was there because the blackbird suddenly made a very strange little call which it only does when there's aerial predators around and froze and was looking up and that guided me to where this bird was otherwise i would have missed it but it's all about just taking time and looking you know it doesn't matter if a bird's common doesn't matter if a butterfly's common um if a, if a, a bee a bumblebee is something you see every day if you watch it you'll learn something there's just just so much going on and sometimes we we bypass it because we want to go and see something rare or, or we don't think that's interesting. It's not as interesting as watching a wildlife documentary where they're focusing on something amazing predator or, or something like that. There's so much going on in our gardens and, and in our parks and in the countryside around us, in the towns around us, in the cities around us. It's just about taking that time to just absorb it. And And, and I always ask why, you know, if I see something, I still ask why. And I think as adults, that's a question that we we lose. As kids, we always ask why to everything. But as we get older, we don't like to ask, why is that doing that? Why why am I seeing this? Why is that happening? Um, I sometimes think maybe we feel inhibited about asking why, but we should. should always ask why something is doing something. And it's amazing then when your mind starts trying to answer that, how many other sort of doors it can open up and you start to notice other things. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say about, you know, observation, because I was clearing a room out the other day and I came across some notebooks that I was writing when I was, what, 10, 
mm. um, in my garden or from my bedroom looking out into my garden in Wembley, North London, and making meticulous notes about how a wood pigeon was pecking at the lettuce or, you know, how a flock of sparrows came in. You know, I was writing all these notes. Um, and you know what? I don't, I'm not embarrassed by that at all. I think it's amazing in a way because you kind of see things that you now know um it's now been sort of written in books in terms of mm. how things behave but at the time when you have nothing no reference books you're just looking out of, of your window or just noticing things it's, it's a discovery and i think as you say i think we lose it's almost as if our curiosity our childlike curiosity mm. has been surgically removed by the time you're about 10 or something you know and mm. you are expected to know everything um do you think that TV is a problem? Because I sometimes feel when I'm out in the field that people expect to see exactly what they've just seen on television. You know, yeah. they expect to see things super close. They expect to see things being killed in front of your eyes and all that sort of stuff. Do you think that's a, a, an issue? Yeah, definitely. Um, and also, not, I mean, there are you know some programs now that, that do focus on more common uh, wildlife, but in the past it was always so something special you know it would always be something exciting something special in you know if they were going to look at a british mammal it would be maybe an otter or a pine martin it wouldn't be a, you know a field vole um and invariably you know when i was growing up sunday nights uh was always wildlife documentary night but it would always be africa and it was amazing you know seeing lions and leopards and and everything else but it was never about the wildlife that i'd see outside it just it was never you know it was never ever featured and you know programs like spring watch and autumn watch and, and and the other watches are very good in that they do look at um ordinary wildlife going around you know around you know a blue tits nest or a, a chaffinch nest or something like that um, but there's still that tendency to focus on things and you know i i've um over the years I've, I've been involved in various tv programs and i know you have and you you know it takes a long time to put together a, a sequence that will go out for maybe 15 seconds. You know, I can remember doing some stuff on uh, deer rutting and we spent the entire day um, filming deer not doing what they wanted. And eventually they got the little snippet of the, of the two bucks fighting, two fallow buck fighting. And that's what went out. And it, it gives the impression that if you, you go out into the woods in the autumn, you're going to see deer fighting. 99% of the time they don't fight they don't want to fight because fighting's a risk um but that's what you tend to see on the tv programs they focus on those dramatic um east end the type moments i suppose you could call them yeah yeah can you take us through a truncated version of a, a year where you are in terms of you know what's what happens from from january the first how, how does how does a year unfold well, I mean, we've already noticed birds in the garden prospecting and pairing up. I mean, we've got two robins now that are suddenly tolerant of one another, whereas before, you know, they, they couldn't stand the sight of one another. They're now tolerant. We've seen them, we think, prospecting for uh, a nest site. On the 3rd of January, we watched our male blackbird. He's been joined by a female and she was in, we've got a wall that's covered in ivy and she was in there prospecting for a nest whilst he was he was perched um nearby getting all nervous um so that's already happening from the beginning of january the blue tits are already taking an interest in the box so things are already beginning to happen and then as the day length increases and, and day length is is probably more key to a lot of species than, than we give it credit for as the day length increases and the temperatures hopefully warm up and the weather and it stops raining it'd be nice if it stopped raining um suddenly you, you notice the birds doing more like that you start seeing the insects in the garden um that you know we're missing at the moment we're getting a few i've got some daffodils coming out and, and some other early flowers are beginning to come out it won't be long before we start seeing insects and then you get a bit of bit of warmth maybe the end of february we we'll, might see a brimstone butterfly come out of hibernation um mid-march we should start hearing a you know chiff chaffs the end of the month hopefully we'll see um swallows and all of a sudden, everything's bursting into leaf and growing. The trees start leafing up and everything begins to change. And then and it almost settles. It seems like it settles down. It's, it's probably the busiest time of the year for, for the wildlife around, sort of from April onwards. You know, everything's breathing, but everything feels more settled, I think. And 
you start to see species coming into the garden looking for food that you wouldn't normally see um, bird species um, that you know you, I mean we sometimes get pied wagtails come into the garden and have a bit of a feed run because they've got young somewhere we don't normally get them in the garden we, we get newts appearing all over the place uh, slow worms have even had slow worm in the kitchen before which was um which was surprising but it was better than extra majora because i had a horseshoe whip snake in the house in extra majora which was rather exciting um and not very easy to get rid of uh so yeah it sort of progresses along and then all of a sudden you start to notice it winding down a bit the 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 hawthorn in the garden the beautiful flowers have turned to berries and they start to redden up the holly berries become noticeable on the holly tree and you realize that you know the, the year's winding down I grow a lot of veg as well, or try to, and that's a really good way of, of watching the season sort of ticking along. I mean, it, you know, in three or four weeks time, I'll be planting some parsnips and I, I won't be harvesting them until September, October time. But it's watching that that growth. It's I don't know, it just it trickles you along, really guides you along. And then obviously in autumn, you, you, you get the autumn colours on the trees, which um, is something that, that people make a, a lot of. It's not something I actually really pay much attention to because i'm colorblind so i don't see colors like you see colors it's it's a totally different world to me and i don't notice those sort of changes um i see other things that other people don't see but those sort of things just they pass me by but what i really love about the autumn is is the fungi when all of a sudden there's just an abundance of fungi suddenly appears in places that there's been no trace of it at all all year and then before you know it the leaves are dropping off the trees and you're hearing the beautiful chuckling of field fairs overhead and and standing out on the my back door on a on an october night and listening to red wings flying past is always something i look forward to and you know i mean i'm hearing field fairs and red wings now but it won't be long before certainly from the southwest of britain they're already beginning to to move move back east and before i know it i won't be hearing them but it's you never notice things departing you notice them arriving but you don't notice them departing necessarily and all of a sudden i'll be thinking oh i haven't heard a field fair for a while and then i'll be listening to the, the dunnock singing in the garden instead and then then suddenly you're back into spring and the chiff chaffs are back and and so on and so forth and it just carries on and i i find that amazing with, with seasons is that they do roll on regardless and you know, we've become a bit detached from them in our lives because seasons don't mean so much to us. And that if we want to go to the shop and buy fruit and veg, we'll just buy it because it's always there. But it wasn't that long ago that you wouldn't have been able to have done that. You'd have had to have um, gone when they were in season. And we've we've lost that connection. But wildlife doesn't have that. You know, seasons dictate their rhythm of life. They are very much slaves to the seasons. And, and, and if, um, you know, birds birds like swallows for example if they turned up here too early and we had a cold snap and there was no insects they're going to starve it's as simple as that it's there's no there's there's no gray margins with 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 wildlife when it comes to how their their life is run the seasons dictate everything for them and i think watching that for a year and we can all do it we can all take time just to make a few notes of what we're seeing in our day-to-day -day lives you will start to see this pattern emerging and this 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 constant change it is constantly changing and so I, I, I love i think I, I love seasons and i love um i think it would be very boring to live um say in the tropics in a part of the world where you don't really get seasons you just it's either raining or it isn't you don't get that that change and those complete contrasts from you know i think we had plus 35 here in the garden in the summer and we've had minus 10 you know, there are, there are many places in the world where you just don't get that variation in temperature and, and that, that contrast in seasons. See, I, I've heard a lot of people say that. I remember when I used to visit Los Angeles quite a lot, people used to say, or English people, oh, I miss the seasons. It's always sunny here. And I was thinking, I love it. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I personally, I mean, it's interesting, you know, to, to go somewhere. I mean, I, I think of stark seasons. I think of places like Norway, I remember going to Oslo once in January, around about now, and there was thick snow and the roads were very slippery and all that sort of stuff. And then to come back to that region in June, I remember going to Helsinki around that time, and it was like a heat wave. And, you know, you can see the differences. And for me, the seasons there are very stark, whereas in the UK, um, for me, I don't know, it, it, it seems to, to 
Well, I think the question I've got for you, Ashley, is do you think that people have kind of become immune to seasons? Do you think they've actually lost their their connection to seasonality, you know, connections yeah. to, to how the world changes over the course of a year? I think so, yes. I, um, I mean, there's obviously things like, you know, in, in, in get to December, it's it's dark when people go to work it's dark when they come back from work and people do notice that and i think that that, that i think that affects people a lot psychologically as well um but really other than that when we're, we're a bit immune to what the seasons mean now um you know, british weather is, is famous famous for being very variable uh but we may be finding now with climate change that actually we are going to have wetter winters and drier summers and that will be, may be a a more noticeable change in our seasons i suppose for people but yeah we we don't seasons are almost irrelevant um we still you know we celebrate certain parts of the season so spring is you know is, is celebrated in many religions and you know in christianity it's easter but it, it's it's something that it's that rebirth of life isn't it and christmas um is based around the shortest day of the year and, and the, the increasing daylight from then on and you know there's lots of these sort of uh social markers if you like within our calendar but their relevance to the seasons now is is very tenuous we just don't have that connection you know we don't have that we we don't we don't have to think about when are we going to plant the crops that we're going to need to harvest so that we can get through the winter we just don't have that we we've got supermarkets we don't we we've lost that connection and yeah it, i think it's quite sad that we've done that yeah it'd be terrible if if you know were betide but if if britain suddenly had to sort of sink back into the uh you know back in the dark ages and we had to you know plant our own plants and stuff you know our, our own farming it'd be awful do you know much about the seasonal um disorder season is it seasonal affective disorder um sad do you know much um, about that? I've, I've known people i've worked with people that have um suffered from it and have had uh, light boxes in their offices i do think it 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 plays a part in our lives and i think it can be a bit depressing especially when the weather's uh, like it is at the moment where it's very very wet i think what covid taught a lot of people was is having that access to the garden to your local park to anywhere green even if it's just looking out your window um was uh was very very important to everybody and when the weather's like it is and when it's very dark if you're if you're having to travel into work you know you're leaving home it's dark you get to work it's raining you can't go out in your lunch break because it's chucking it down you drive home in the dark you suddenly you're losing that connection and i do think it, it plays a big part psychologically on people and uh i think it's something that was recognized a long time ago hence why the shortest day of the year the solstices were marked because it was it things are getting better the daylight is is lengthening um we all know to be outside on a on a lovely um, blue sky day, whether it's a frosty winter day or a, a, a nice, nice warm spring day or a hot summer's day, it feels great. It feels good. We, we, we get a buzz from it. And when that's deprived from you, be that because of the lack of daylight or because when you do get that daylight, the weather's not very conducive to going outside. I think it does play a, a part in how we are psychologically. And for some people, um, it it's a lot worse than it is for others. I just wonder, I mean, no disrespect to anyone who suffers from this ailment, but I do wonder whether it is more of a, more to, more to do with our lifestyles. The fact that, you know, going to work in the dark, coming home in the dark, and we hate our work, you know, so it kind of adds to that. Um, for me, I'm, and I'm sure for you, we'll, and many people here and watching in the future, I'm sure we're lucky because even on a winter's day, for me, it's great to get out. You know, I love it when it's raining and going out when it's raining because you, you sometimes get a private ringside seat to things that would never normally show themselves because there'd be so many people around. You know, I, I, I wrote an article, funny enough, yesterday uh, for the RSPB's magazine about um, urban beaches. And I, I recalled a moment, a day when I went to Margate in Kent and it was chucking down the wind, you know, it's like horrible weather wise, but I was walking along the beach and it was great because I had curlews and turnstones nearby, you know, and, and black headed gulls and things like that. I had the whole beach to myself. 
and it was exhilarating you know cold windy. yeah absolutely it was fantastic and i just wonder whether you know again because we are so disconnected to nature because we back in the day when you know people in britain were out in the fields you know doing the harvest and planting and all that sort of stuff you had to go out come in you know, rain or shine mm. you know and i think maybe because we are so insulated you know we're in our homes watching netflix in the evenings when it's dark <laughs> drinking a cup of tea um you just totally get become divorced don't you you do i mean i, I was a forest ranger for 20 years and and I used to love it when it rained. I mean, you had the gear, you were you were able to keep dry, but uh, a period of wet weather out in the forest, yeah, everything was was muddy and, and and you're out and about, but you'd see a lot more, and mainly because there weren't so many other people out and about with their dogs running around and causing disturbance. So, you know, I've had some really amazing close experiences with with wildlife, like like roe deer, for example, in the pouring rain. Um, because they've it's almost like they're, they're they're not expecting you to be there because it's it, it's not human weather, and yeah, I, I was lucky. I mean, I'd go to work. I might go to work in the dark, and I might come home in the dark. But during the day, I was out in the forest all the time, regardless of the weather. And like you saying um, about being out in the rain, I mean, you get up onto Dartmoor in a in a in a in a real windy, wet storm. It's exhilarating. It's amazing. Um, people think you're a bit crazy, but it's just. Yeah, it's it's an incredible experience. And, you know, I grew up in, in a place called Exmouth in East Devon and um, at the beach on our doorstep. And as kids, we spent all our time on the beach. But for me, the, the, my best memories of being on that beach are when there's a storm blowing in in the winter and watching yeah. the clouds over the sea and seeing lightning out over the sea. It's yeah, I, I mean, it's great. One of the one of the weirdest things I ever did in the rain, and I'm not being naughty now, by the way, guys was uh to go out in the middle of a wood albeit in london but it was in a wood in the middle of the night in the pouring rain and have a picnic on a bench in the pouring rain <laughs> with your hoods up and all that sort of stuff and it was it was weird but it was really quite exhilarating because it's something i've never done before in my life and it was like wow you know in the rain pouring out a glass of wine in pouring rain <laughs> Yeah. it's getting diluted oh, yeah. in two seconds you know but it's just it's just, it's just I, I recommend everyone here try that next time it pours with rain go to a forest with someone you like sit at a park bench and pull out your your picnic and that and see what it's like and come back to me and give let me know how, how, it, how it went <laughs> um your part of devon sounds idyllic i don't know dartmoor that well i've only been there a couple of times in my life actually uh, and in fact devon is one i mean i've been to uh ex 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 smith ex smith yeah yeah i've been to exeter as yeah. well i've seen cell buntings there once yeah um has there been you know is there much um, development going on around where you are oh yeah i mean um the house building that's been happening over the last few years has just been incredible. Um, you know, we go to a place called Oakhampton, um, which is about eight, 10 miles away from here. And, you know, in, in the eight years that we've been living um, in this village, the house expansion outwards is, is, is incredible. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's gone across the valley that was always the parish boundary and it's halfway up the other side of the next valley i mean the houses that are going in are incredible um and you yeah i mean that's just going to put more and more pressure on on the countryside around it i mean how do you feel when you when you see all that development going on you're powerless you know you basically you know one month later you come back there's a house there and then you know how how does that make you feel i always feel a bit sad about it um especially when it's areas that you knew perhaps when you were a child and you can remember um you know just exploring and, and almost sort of um having your first discovery of of nature and wildlife um and, and Exmouth's a great example i mean it was in the 80s i think it was the quickest growing town in britain for a stage and you know fields um that i used to grow up in and, and run around in and climb the trees of and things like that are gone they're all houses now and you know it's it's, it's sad and, and we do seem to just rush forward and develop and we it's interesting how the areas we choose as well we tend to choose the areas um, that are of lower agricultural value uh, for development but they're often the areas that are of higher wildlife value 
and so it, it, it has a big impact yeah it's, it is sad i remember when i was a kid um living in wembley and graduating from watching my garden to walking down to local park and there was a tiny park which was mostly lawns but there was a river that ran through the middle of well, along the side of it which was concrete basically a concrete basin but then across the river was this area of derelict land which for me stretched for miles and it was my playground it was my countryside i used to go there with my mate we used to make camps we used to you know make fires and cook baked beans that we nicked from our mum's cupboards and even once had a chicken and my mate was very much into chemistry so we used to make bombs because he wanted to become a scientist so we used to buy chemicals from the from from the uh from the pharmacy i can't i can't believe that the pharmacy would allow you know sell us sell kids you know inflammable mm. materials but you know it was great it was it was actually really exhilarating to find flocks of tree sparrows which i took for granted because they were always yeah. in the winter and then one day i show up and then there's like diggers and cranes in my in my territory in my kingdom what are you doing there mm. and then mm. literally a few, a few months later there's this ugly housing estate filled with screaming kids litter well there's litter there before anyway but dogs and all that sort of stuff and my paradise is gone you know yeah. and that was in a in an urban area and that was heartbreaking even though it's the first time I've ever experienced it because I was a kid you know mm -hmm. so it must be awful you know living in the countryside and you know turning looking down the valley and seeing oh there's two more houses there now it, it, it must be so soul destroying especially when you consider how depleted we are I mean do you it is do you, do, you, do you actually, you know, you make notes and stuff, but do you, do you actually keep, have you kept counts of all the birds and other wildlife you've seen over the years? Have you seen trends? I mean, obviously, skylight's gone down, but have any birds and animals, other animals sort of increased or? Um, I don't think you necessarily, I mean, I, I've never been a, a, a lister, uh, um, so I don't make lists of things I see habitually. I now wish I did because it's such a brilliant resource to have to look back through. Uh, interestingly, the only time I've really ever kept wildlife di diaries is when I've been living in Spain and I've got a real, really good archive of those. And that's really good. And I wish I'd done it for here. And even when I was um, a ranger in the forests in, in Britain, you didn't really, I, I don't know, you just didn't record things. You do notice a few things. So, I mean, the one thing I remember noticing disappearing from the forest was cuckoo. I mean, you you know, we'd hear cuckoo all the time and then suddenly you'd only hear them in one area and then that was it. No cuckoos in the spring. Things like that you notice, but there's so many things we don't notice are disappearing and it's often the common species. So house sparrows is a, is a classic. People, it took a long time for people to realise that house sparrows are disappearing because they're they're common. We don't we don't really look at them that much and then suddenly you think oh i haven't seen a house sparrow um but yeah i, I wish i i do wish i'd kept a much more detailed um sort of notebook on things i was seeing just day-to-day -day things because you know as we we both know and as probably everyone listening knows that those day-to-day -day things when we were younger are now actually quite rare in many many cases but we just we didn't notice it and we didn't take note of the common stuff and that's left a bit of a void in our knowledge as well I, I will can i just say it's been noticed in some of the comments i thought it was quite interesting how many of us went through a bomb making phase as we were growing up um i mean i i, I had the royal marine commando training area up the road from where when, when i was a kid and we used to um shall we say acquire stuff off them and, and make our own um uh banging devices which was which was good fun but um it got a bit scary in the end so we we, we stopped but uh but yeah it's, it's incredible how many kids go through that stage yeah I, I thought we were the only ones i mean it was interesting i mean ranging from throwing an aerosol can into a fire to actually constructing something that will combust you know and um we wanted to make a crater for some reason um yeah 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 the bigger the better you know so it was it was something that was a bit uh, counterintuitive i suppose in many ways but um but anyway um going back to seasonality your lovely book um which is a personal account of nature through the season. And actually, you know what? I haven't even talked about who you are because normally people, you know, 
I mean, the people watching now may not even know who you are, other than the fact that you have actually written this book. And you've mentioned a couple of times that you've been a ranger, but um, for twenty for the last twenty years, and um, and you were working with a wide variety of wildlife, everything from dormice to predatory goshawks. And in twenty twelve, you set up Griffin Holidays, um, running specialist bird tours to Exeter Judah. And you also are a very great writer for Birdwatching magazine. And I think that's when I first sort of really started sort of mm. coming across you. So that's who you are. So you obviously, you know, have been writing uh, for some time. Um, in this book, there's been a couple of sort of moments I've noticed. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me or tell us about some of your moments. I mean, one of the moments I noticed uh, that you talked about in the book was when you were making a cup, cup of coffee and you noticed a wood pigeon behaving a bit weirdly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was just uh, looking outside the window and um, our garden's on two levels. We've got a, it's a 17th century cottage and the garden's a bit of a rambling two level uh, garden. And um, I was just looking out the window and up, up on the top level, I've got a cloche and the roof of it is out above the fence. And the wood pigeon was sat on it, which it often does. But instead of sort of ambling around like the wood pigeon normally does, it was frozen stiff, looking at it, just not knowing what to do. It was, it, I, I couldn't, I couldn't make it. I thought, what's on earth wrong with that? And I was stood there looking at it, wondering whether there was something wrong. When sort of directly behind it, and we got a, a willow that I pollard every year, so I prune it right back every year. And in amongst the new growth was a dark shape. And I thought, what's that? And I, I realised it was a tawny owl. And it, it was the middle of the day. And this tawny owl, I guess it had been disturbed from its normal daytime roost, had just gone into the willow tree and sat there. And it was staring at the pigeon. I was staring at the pigeon. And this poor wood pigeon was was there in between the stairs of two predators at the end of the day. You know, people who kill wood pigeons. A tawny owl, well, I wouldn't put it past the tawny owl. I mean, they're, they're, they can be um, pretty... Um, pretty aggressive when they want to be and this poor pigeon was just sat there not knowing what to do because there was a tawny owl behind it and i was in front of it and i, I, I suddenly lost all in, in, oh yeah there's photos um there's a photo in the book isn't there of the yeah. tawny owl um yeah you just sit there and and it was just amazing and it was just one of those it was a serendipitous moment you know i just happened to look out the window notice the wood pigeon and, and again, it's what I was going back to earlier about looking at common things. If I'd have looked out the window and gone, oh, it's just a wood pigeon out there and carried on past the window, I would never have seen the tawny owl. It was because I was looking at the wood pigeon and thinking, well, why are you doing that? It's asking why and looking at common things. And I suddenly realized why it was doing it because it was it was scared stiff. It didn't know what to do. There was this tawny owl. And, and um, I called my wife and we, 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 we stood there watching this tawny owl. It, it, you could see us i mean it was looking at us but it was relaxed it just sat there and um eventually it, it, it flew off and we often hear tawny owls and we see see dark shadows of them at night but to see one like that in our back garden was just a brilliant thrill really good yeah it sounds it in my world uh the words just and only are four letter words and i rally tours i say to people if you ever say that word to me you're going to be fined whatever currency out there you know, wherever we are you get fined currency because uh it's to get people to actually engage. But what other points, what other sort of highlights uh, did you have during your seasonal look at your your immediate world? It was a few, well, I think I like looking at all sorts of things. Um, so watching uh, the blue tits build a nest in the nest box that I'd made and put up, that that's, that's a great thing. And if you've got a garden, if you've got somewhere where you can put a bird box up, put it up because and if you can build it yourself build it yourself but even if you don't and you buy it from somewhere the thrill of seeing birds using something that you've either made or put up yourself is brilliant and watching young fledged from a box that you've put up in your garden is just you know because they wouldn't have done it without you you've 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 done that so that's always a highlight things like that i think in the book i i recount a, a story of squeaking up a roebuck during the summer rut i'm um, in the fields and and um this goes back to being a forest ranger but uh roe deer the males um the, the females will make a, a soft little squeaky call and it's something you don't really hear as a human but roebucks are very tuned into it and they'll come looking and i'd been taught how to do this 30 odd years ago when i first um started with the forestry commission and i was aware there was a roebuck i could hear it barking 
So I tried my, my squeak and you sort of think, oh, I'm not sure that worked. Anyway, the road bucket just went dead silent. No sound. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but can you squeak for us? Can you squeak? Um, <laughs> probably not really. It's sort of, I don't know if that worked. Um, it's a strange noise, but you sort of try it and um, the road bucket had gone quiet and I thought, uh, he's gone. And, um, and then suddenly I find myself sort of face to face with it. And it's like, whoa, you know, and, and it just things like that, just silly things like that, really, that um, I think are great. And, and, and you know, finding uh, fungus coming up in, um, in, in woodlands. And, and I love, I love foraging for food and, and making my own food. And, you know, there's a, an area of, of uh, woodland I, I go to and you see your first amethyst deceivers, which are a, a bright purple color. They're, they're lovely things to eat. They're, they're, they're not a gourmet mushroom, but they're great in, uh, in a salad. And obviously being colorblind and looking for fungi isn't necessarily a great combination, but even I can't mistake um, amethyst deceivers. And, and just the thrill of finding that and taking back a handful to, to have in your tea at night. And, um, you know, and, and listen, like I said earlier, listening to the red wings flying over the house. That's, that's a great sound every year, especially when you start thinking about where those birds have just traveled from to get to where you are and, and watching them in the mornings feeding on the, um, the berries, of the hawthorns. And I don't know, it's, it's all, all of it's a thrill. You're saying about having a fining system for people that say just and only. I can remember living in extra and popping back over to Britain to see some, uh, to see family. And I went to uh, an RSPB reserve on the ex estuary at Bowling Green Marsh, and I was walking down to meet people in the hide, and uh, a small bird caught my eye in the head. So I got my bins on it, and I was thrilled to bits. It was a cold tit. Now, you don't really get cold tits in a lot of extra majority. You can find them in, if you go to the right places, but for the majority of the area, they're just not a bird you see. And obviously, being a forest ranger for 20 years, a cold tit was a very common bird to me. And I suddenly realized I hadn't seen one for 10 months. So I just stood there enraptured by this lovely little bird in the hedge with my binoculars. And some birders on the way to the hide stopped and said, oh, got anything good? I said, yeah, I've got a cold tit. And they actually swore at me, told me to, you know, go away sort of thing. And it was like, what? You know, <laughs> I just, just think, what's wrong with you? You know, it's, it's a, they're fantastic little birds. Um, it's that thrill of seeing, I just love watching animal behavior, really. It fascinates me. Do you think uh, this book would have an appeal for people living in urban areas? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, obviously, I've written it, um, you know, living in the centre of a village in Devon. But like I say, I mentioned going into Exeter and um, walking around the parks and seeing the wildlife in the parks, um, noticing things like grey squirrels. And I know they're an alien mammal, but, they, you know, they're, they're, they're here. They're an accessible wildlife for people. Um, in peregrines in cities now i mean you know the, the cities in britain are the best places to go and watch peregrines most of the time they're, they're doing really well and yeah i, I think so you, you can have nature is all around you even if it's a window box you're still going to get nature there um you know nature doesn't have to be big and impressive it can it can be um, a small insect it can be um, a worm it can be a bee it can be um, a sparrow they're still amazing things and it's, it's about allowing yourself to, to experience that. So yeah, I'd hope it, it, it would be um, something that would appeal to people in urban areas because there's plenty of wildlife in urban areas. What's your favorite season? Um, I thought about this a lot and it's difficult because I, I tend to live in the moment. I mean, I do like spring and I love, I mean, spring 2020 was very special. I think with what was happening in the world, no one really knew what was going on and being stuck not able to do what I would normally be doing and experiencing that swallow was a special, um, special moment. But, you know, I like the winter. It's, it's wet and miserable at the moment. It's a bit depressing, but you know, you notice the daylight, so the day length is, is increasing and things are beginning to happen. Um, I, it's, it's a bit like when someone says to you, what's your favorite bird? You think, Oh, it's gotta be that. And then you think, Oh, actually, what about them? Well, they're quite good. Then you see another bird and you think, Oh, I quite like that. And it's, you know, what's your favorite song? Oh, I, Oh, actually that's, I don't know. It's a difficult one to answer because I tend to sort of live in the moment and I enjoy um, what's happening around me. You know, there's, there's never nothing happening in, in the wildlife world. You just won the lottery and after paying for your luxury house and what have you and, and <laughs> looking after your family, you got a million pounds for it to money. What would you do to it or do with it, should I say, to help conservation? 
Well, I mean, that's there's so many great organisations. I think um, I quite like the idea of what's happening now with, with buying up land and allowing nature to manage it, sort of what people call rewilding. I quite like that as a concept, and I, I think that might be a good thing to invest in. But then there's, there's groups like, for example, Wild Justice that Mark Avery and Chris Packham and Ruth Tinge, um run and, you know, fighting often in court uh, to defend British wildlife against very poor legislation. Um, I, I, you know, the, that's, that would be a cause that I think I'd think uh, long and hard about donating to because I think that that's a very important thing and sad that we need organisations like that. Yeah. All right, so just to let everyone know that um, on the 19th of January, which I think might be next Monday, possibly, um, we've got Mike Toms, who works for the BTO, and he's here talking, or will be here, talking about his new book that is curating called Into the Reds, and it's all about all the, uh, the red-listed species in the UK, and this it's written by by poets and writers and illustrated by a whole range of different artists. So it's a really interesting um, look at how we can preserve and, and actually celebrate some of these species. So that'd be a very interesting evening, I'm sure. Um, on the 23rd of January, we've got Mark Haidt. Uh, Mark Haidt has um, put together, he's created a new handbook on European birds and it's all photo photographs. And you might think, oh, I've seen it all before, but actually this book's fascinating because he's talked, he's spoken to all the sort of experts in Europe and it's actually got some really interesting things featured in the book that I've never seen anywhere else. So who were talking about that? Uh, on the 26th of January, we've got Dr. Karen Backer here and she's talking about sounds. You know, it's fascinating. She's written, she's written a book um, which I've got somewhere, and it's all about the fact that we have a very tiny sort of spectrum of hearing, and then other wildlife, you know, is just, I mean, she's going to talk to about talk to us about it. that's going to be fascinating. And on the 30th of January, we got Arjun, and I can't pronounce his surname, Dutchman, who's got the record of seeing the most amount of birds in one year. He's going to talk about that. And there's a load of stuff coming up in January, sorry, in February and March. So, um, Please tune in, keep tuning in. Um, if you want to see the question and answer sections of or sessions of any of the In Conservation With uh, series, you need to be a member of the Urban Bird World community. It's uh, a benefit for those who join, so that's a good thing to do. Um, but I think I'm left with thanking you, Ian, for sparing an hour of your evening to talk to us about your great book, Seasonality. Indeed. <laughs> so thank you very and, much. and don't forget don't forget the vultures as well <laughs> there you go and um, zoomers as ever thank you very much for joining us tonight this afternoon this morning and hope to see you again and until we meet again hopefully very soon keep looking up <laughs>